Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Thursday, May 13th. And this afternoon, we are going to be considering S7, um, a bill pertaining to expungement and sealing of criminal records. And we're going to be looking at draft 3.0, which is on our committee website. And we will start with a walkthrough of this draft uh, by attorney Bryn Hare. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee. For the record, uh, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, so here to talk about draft 3.0 of S7. And <clears throat> I'll just start out by saying that I was uh, asked to create this draft that removes um, two of the sections of the, of the bill as, it, uh, as you've seen it prior to this point and as it came over from the Senate. Um, and those two sections are the section that uh, defines what it, crimes are um, eligible for sealing or expungement. So the qualifying crime definition uh, section has been removed, and also the section that sets out the um, each different category of crime um, and how it's eligible for either sealing or expungement or both. So those two sort of big provisions of the bill uh, are you will not see in this draft. Um, so that I would say is the really biggest change um, that you'll see. And the other changes uh, you'll see some language in yellow highlight, and that's just all the, I highlighted all the differences from the Senate version that came over to you. So you'll see everything that has changed from uh, what came over from the Senate, except for those two sections that are just gone. So if everybody has the bill in front of them, um, I'll just go ahead and start. Section one, this is the listed crime definition. Um, and you'll remember that this just makes some technical updates to this uh, to the list of crimes that are included in this definition. There's no changes to this section from the version as it passed the Senate. <clears throat> Same with section two, no changes from the Senate version. This is that language um, that uh, sort of implements that provision about the surcharges and how those are um, waived if the person has an inability to pay. Section three is the effective ceiling section. Um, there is one change to this section as it came over from the Senate and we talked about that in the last draft. If you remember, this section provides that the court has to make a reasonable effort to notify a person whose record is sealed that um, they may have the opportunity to have that record expunged. And the change here is just to the, what reasonable effort means. Um, and it means that the court has to attempt to notify the person by electronic means rather than by phone call and um, or first class mail their last known address. So that's the change to that section from the Senate version. Section four, this has to do with sealing of records um, for people who are juveniles at the time they committed a crime. And there's no change to this section as it came over from the Senate. Um, so I'll scroll down to section five. This is the section that has to do with um, offenses from the Judicial Bureau that are now eligible for expungement. And you'll see a bunch of yellow highlighting here. And the committee will probably remember um, that the changes here are really um, sort of, I wouldn't call them policy differences between this version and the Senate version. It, this language was requested by Judge Grierson to um, more appropriately implement this section based on the agreement that the court administrator's office has with um, the, or between the Judicial Bureau and the Department of Motor Vehicles um, to ensure that these are appropriately, these records are appropriately handled um, pursuant to this section. One change that you made to this section um, that it is a policy change is at the bottom of page, <clears throat> bottom of page nine, and this is the provision that um, creates an exception to the expungement requirement for research entities. Um, and it, I actually shouldn't describe this as a policy change. This is really making it clear um, that research entities that have these records in their possession already um, are not required to destroy them once they've been expunged. Um, and this only applies to research entities that are maintaining these types of records for the purposes of analyzing and disseminating criminal justice data, um, primarily, I believe, to the legislature at, at, at the General Assembly's request. 
So um, this is not happening currently. Researchers already, if you remember from the effective expungement statute, have access to this information. So this is just making it abundantly clear in this provision regarding ju um, judicial bureau records uh, because of the way the statute is worded that requires that all records that are maintained outside of the judicial bureau's case management system have to be destroyed. Um, we've added this language to make it clear that, that that requirement does not apply to research entities. So that's really new language that didn't exist in the Senate version. <clears throat> And then lastly, section six, um, this is the study language. So I've highlighted Justice Oversight Committee because you'll remember that um, the Senate version had this study being done by the Sentencing Commission. So you've made a few changes here to the study. The first is to shift um, who's responsible for it from the Sentencing Commission to Justice Oversight. And then also I've highlighted the word um, I've highlighted the words or most on line nine. So really you're changing the directive a little bit so that the committee is now um, tasked with considering a comprehensive policy that would consider all or most offenses um, for eligibility for expungement, except for those big 12 offenses. And then that next sentence that's in yellow highlight sort of gives a little bit more direction um, for the committee to um, Consider whether to exclude from expungement or sealing eligibility those uh, criminal offenses that are associated with or resulting from domestic and sexual violence. So kind of asking them to take a, take a look specifically at those types of crimes and consider whether they should be eligible or not. And then the last change is in subdivision one there, um, lines 14 to 17. And this is this is the list of, um, of directives for the committee to propose legislation on. So it's recommendations on a policy to make all or most records eligible for sealing or expungement, except for big 12 offenses and any other offenses the committee deems appropriate for exclusion. So it's just giving a little bit more discretion. This language gives a little more discretion to the committee to, um, to look at all the offenses and determine what, uh, what offenses should be appropriate and um, for eligibility for sealing or expungement. And then the remaining subdivisions there, two and three and four, those directives remain the same. So the committee has to, shall propose legislation on its recommendations on what crime should be eligible, individuals or entities that should have access to sealed records, whether Vermont should carry on with this um, sealing and expungement, or if we should just use one or the other, and then implementing a petitionless process um, to get records sealed or expunged. So those directives remain unchanged from the Senate version. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brennan. Thank you so much for the quick turnaround because I know you're busy. <laughs> uh, so questions for, for Bryn, Barbara. Thank you. So Bryn, um, that was really helpful. And uh, one thing I was trying to figure out is, um, let's say when the Justice Oversight Committee is trying to look at the comprehensive policy for theoret, like just go with me for a moment. What if something on the list of crimes that they're not supposed to be considered fits in with that bigger philosophy that they're looking at? this would prohibit them from presenting that like it's it's tying yeah i, I don't just, i i don't think it would prohibit them from doing that it is a directive to the committee so if you want them specifically to consider um crimes on the big 12 list then i i might remove that section but the justice oversight committee can do whatever they like and they can propose whatever legislation they like so Okay, because I know when we heard from um, the governor's attorney, she pointed out that we should look at a comprehensive overhaul. So this almost narrows it from that charge of actually what the commissioner said too that look broadly. And so it's almost predetermining that there's an issue before justice oversight got to fully look at what the underlying principles are. 
by, by specifically excluding the big 12? Because I think that's really the only thing that is specifically excluded, yeah. Yep. So I don't think that's a question for me. That's really more a discussion for the committee, yeah. Okay. And I don't know if this is, this is probably a question for Judge Gerson, but how many, I, I have no idea how many, what percentage of the people that um, the court would try to contact have an electronic way of contacting them? Like, so. Um, it does provide that, or they could also send a letter. So it doesn't right. have to be electronic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Bryn? Thank you, Bryn. So I'd like to know. There we go, David. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to the committee. For the record, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. <clears throat> we do support uh, this way of moving forward, given where things are in the session, and think this is a reasonable uh, way forward. But I also feel the need to correct the record on a number of issues that were discussed yesterday by the administration and to let the committee know where we stand more broadly and where we hope to see this moving forward. But I'll, I'll try not to take up too much of your time in doing that. And I'm of course happy to answer questions uh, as, we, as, we, as I go through this. A couple things I wanna address in particular. One is the broad issue of stakeholder input and uh, that being a part of an expungement process. The second is um, some of the more specific questions about what was being proposed in our prior drafts and uh, some of the back and forth of the administration. And thirdly, I'll just briefly say a couple more words about this draft and some of the upsides actually, I think that haven't been discussed as much so far um, in terms of 3.0, what we're looking at today. First and foremost, we heard yesterday from members of the administration that the way to do expungement appropriately is to ensure a lot of stakeholder input, including from victims uh, and victims advocates and others like that. I wanna be very clear, I know the committee has heard some of this, but I wanna be very clear about the process that led to the bill that was passed by the Senate and that came to this house. That bill did have an enormous amount of stakeholder input. There was a, it was done by the Sentencing Commission, but not only by the Sentencing Commission. The Sentencing Commission produced the proposal that became that bill by creating a subcommittee, which I chaired. That subcommittee did not solely include members of the Sentencing Commission, it included other people as well who had an interest in it. Uh, it's important to remember that the Sentencing Commission itself does have uh, representation from the Center for Crime Victim Services. The proposal that came, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I lost my voice there. Um, <clears throat> the proposal that came out of that subcommittee unanimously was not the most expansive version of an expungement bill that member that some members of that subcommittee wanted. And it was not the most expansive version precisely because victims' voices had a serious part in that and other law enforcement voices had a serious part in that uh, proposal, in that process. And so I just want to be very clear that this already has been a, a highly vetted process and the notion that this was in a, in a process that had real input from law enforcement, from victims advocates who did not in fact agree with the most expansive version of expungement proposals that were being put forward and prevented those from coming forward ultimately. Uh, and ultimately the proposal was agreed to unanimously within the subcommittee. And as a result of that compromise effort, the entirety of the Vermont Sentencing Commission voted in favor of it. Again, I, I believe the committee has heard this, but I was reviewing the minutes from that meeting, which took place in October of 2019, and which at which was present, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, the Department of Corrections, uh, the Department of Public Safety, uh, including the current commissioner, and uh, every single one of those individuals voted affirmatively for the proposal that uh, came out of the Senate, unanimously out of the Senate as well, uh, and came before this committee. So I just want to be very clear about this notion that the bill did not have stakeholder input or needed more stakeholder input to adequately reflect all of the interests going into play. Uh, we feel very strongly that this did have that. The one piece that got added in the Sentencing Commission as I reviewed the minutes was in the full Sentencing Commission before it went, uh, that proposal went out to the legislature was that uh, 
to have this legislature take a second look at the notion of um, the extent to which records should in fact be completely destroyed or not. And that was a point of real contention. You heard from the administration yesterday that, well, if we spend a little more time, we can just figure out this issue of, you know, it's a, like a little thing, or this is my impression of the, the way it was being discussed. It's a, it's, it's a matter we can massage in terms of whether records should be completely destroyed when they're expunged or sealed. I, I can tell you from the debates that that's not a small matter, that that is a fundamental disagreement. Um, a profound disagreement. And when you hear people from both sides of this saying, well, I think we can simplify the process, their ideas about how the process gets simplified are not reconcilable with each other. One of those ideas is to have it all be sealing and the other side's ideas is to have it all be expungement. And the way that we reconciled that in this proposal was to have the two step process where sealing was available early and expungement was available later. There's no other real way and that's partly how we got such a broad buy-in. There's no other real way to massage that either. It's going to, you're going to destroy the records entirely or you are not. Um, and I think for whatever categories of crimes you, you want to, to do that for. Um, and it may ultimately be the case that when this gets considered again, uh, it may be that the side that advocates for having records completely destroyed, which I can tell you is a strong set of voices, uh, may be the ones that win that argument. And because that's going to be a discussion that will have to happen again. Um, but I wouldn't be so confident if you are among the, if, if folks listening are among the group that wants the records to be uh, retained forever, that that's necessarily going to be the side of the argument that wins now. Um, I also want to point out a couple of more specific issues uh, with respect to what was represented yesterday. I heard the governor's council say that there were three points in particular that uh, had not been adequately addressed and wanted to be clear that they had been. And in fact, the law did uh, exactly what the governor's council had asked for it to do. Uh, one was not expanding the waiver authority. In other words, not having it be able to be transferred. As I think the committee understands, the what we have put in the bill is actually a contraction of the current waiver of authority. Uh, it was narrowed, uh, something that we'd spoken against, as you know. Um, so that's just not the case. There was a concern about, and there was, of course, the door was reopened to allow for that if a state's attorney allowed, uh, agreed to it, but that was it. It was still overall a contraction. Uh, one other issue was that um, they didn't want there to be early waiver ability for the felony property offenses that in fact was not there in the bill and that was not allowable. That was not provided for and therefore was not allowable. And the final piece I just want to reiterate is there was the concern was reiterated about the DOC having access, sufficient access to records. During that discussion, the administration repeatedly invoked David DeMora, uh, who then came in and quite emphatically rejected the notion that there was any issue with risk assessments in terms of retaining old records. Um, and I think that is the definitive statement on that, especially given the fact that the administration themselves uh, wanted to, that to be the figure of authority on that. We uh, believe, and I think it is simply accurate to say, if you look back at the governor's council's proposal, that we agreed to every request that the governor made, every specific request that the governor's administration made. Uh, including ones that were made both in, in writing and verbally uh, during testimony in the last couple of weeks. We made those, we agreed to those and, and worked on implementing them because we believed that uh, that could lead to an agreement. Uh, even after all of we were in, and we engaged in that in good faith. Uh, of course, even after all of those were put forward, uh, the administration found reason to oppose those uh, changes despite that, and that was certainly disappointing to us. Uh, but that's also a choice that they made. Um, and that's a choice that they're gonna have to live with. I can tell you that we will push for, as we, <clears throat> as we pushed for previously, and as we, will, and, uh, as we supported previously, a very broad version of the expungement law. We believe that Vermonters want that. We believe that most of the stakeholders want that. And we know that 30 out of 30 members of the Vermont State Senate voted for that already. Uh, so the administration uh, may have left on the table the best opportunity they had to have a narrower version of the expungement bill. And it's certainly our hope and our intention to work to achieve a law that is very broad uh, and that we hope that 
legislative processes will proceed in a way that allows that law to be that expansive version of expungement to become the law regardless of what the governor's office might prefer. Uh, so we uh, stand strongly for expungement still. We will be working hard to achieve an expansive version of expungement, which again, we believe there is a lot of support for. It's disappointing to us that our efforts to accommodate concerns, uh, and we accommodated every concern that was stated, uh, turned out not to actually be uh, a real negotiation. Um, and we don't believe that we ever could have, as it turns out, it, it certainly appears that we never could have found agreement given, uh, given the, how events unfolded. So that I just wanted to correct the record on those points, make it clear where we stand and what we're gonna be working for and hopefully supporting uh, you, the legislature and the Joint Justice Oversight Committee in working for. We support, you know, we do support where this bill has gone and, the, and I do wanna end on a positive note here <laughs> by saying that section five has gotten almost no discussion in the committee. Uh, this is the uh, expungement for violation of records. But this was actually, this took us a lot of work to design back in 2019. We actually think it's a really important innovation. It's the first time that violations are gonna be able to be expunged ever in Vermont. Um, these types of changes don't always make headlines. They're not the thing that gets written about uh, or that even gets, you know, gets noticed all that much. But these types of changes, especially around our driving laws and about the sort of burden that low income drivers have to carry can have really consequential impacts for low income Vermonters. Some members of this committee, uh, some members, current members of the committee were here last year when you all passed the SR22, the change to SR22 insurance. Um, again, that didn't get a lot of attention, but I can tell you because our programs work with folks who labored under those restrictions, that that has made a huge difference in the lives of Vermonters. We live in a rural state where people have to drive uh, and it's saved people money. It's gotten people driving legally again, which is what we want. Uh, it's, it's what's safest. Um, and so things like section five don't get as much attention, but they're really important. I'm a, I'm, I'm, we are pleased to see that that at least will continue. Uh, forward this year. And I think that will make a big difference, even if it doesn't get as much attention as some of these other issues. So I just wanted to end on a more <laughs> uplifting note here. And I appreciate the committee for indulging me here. Uh, I did feel the need after all the work that's gone into this, all the work that our office has done on it and that, and, um, and that you've all done on it, I did feel the need to just correct some of those points that were made and to make clear where we are. So thank you to the committee and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. I, Barbara, are you going to ask your question about the study and about the crimes? Because I was going to um, ask. Um, I wasn't actually. Okay. Was different question. Right. Okay. Then, um, so, so David, I don't know if you um, heard Barbara's question earlier, but in terms of the study, um, it it says that the Big Twelve will be ineligible and and carves those out. And and Barbara was wondered wondering if if we should do that. Um, I. I you could do it. I'm not actually too worried about it because this is a directive to your fellow legislators who can do whatever they want in terms of what they propose. If this is a directive to the Sentencing Commission, then you'd have to be clearer, uh, or you have to be more, you know, more precise. But you know, it's your fellow legislators, and I think they can they can choose to propose legislation as as they decide. So you could change it. I, I wouldn't be too worried about it personally. I I think it'll be fine. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks. So, David, um, you've heard Dale from DOC testify, right? Yes. Um, so there's something that he talked about that um, we I don't think we ever got back to addressing, which is and I'm going to get the word wrong. The, he was saying that the DOC and I can't remember if Commissioner Sherling said this as well, uses the um, the charges that law enforcement uh, initially is proposing. And I know that Martin commented on this rather. So they were saying that if the records, we never know what sort of the plea deal was and they want to look, they want access to those original proposed charges. And I understand in talking to a constituent that that might be like a major violation of, of 
taking into consideration a crime that somebody was not um, convicted of. And I just wondered if your office has been following the use of the pre uh, conviction charges and why they are able, why they're even staying in someone's record. So I actually did testify to this briefly. Um, and I don't know, I don't have current information about what's happening. And I, and I would prefer to uh, assume the best, but obviously we can't, you know, we have to be careful in these things and assumptions aren't always, aren't always wise. To the extent that the government is requiring people to take actions and punishing them or requiring rehabilitation for behavior that um, somebody has not been found guilty of, um, and has not been proven or has not been pled to, I think that's a, I find that disturbing, distressing. And, um, and I would, and I do think that that's something that needs to be investigated more clearly. If in fact, that is what was stated, it's possible I misunderstood what was being said there. Um, but I think as several members of the committee heard it the way you're describing it. And yes, I think that is a, that's a serious concern to me. I, I that, you know, the judiciary gets to say, the judicial process is the process that gets to say what somebody is guilty of or not. And the executive doesn't get to step back in and say, well, we actually think you did this other thing and we're going to treat you accordingly. Um, that's not the way our justice system works. And I think that's unconstitutional and a serious problem for civil liberties. So I do think before I say, you know, we've got, we have a problem on our hands. I do think we need to investigate more clearly. Um, but if that is the case, then that is something that needs to be looked at. And shouldn't that, I, I guess I'm wondering, I mean, because I do feel like we heard that. I mean, I will go back and watch again, but I'm pretty sure we heard that, um, that that is happening with DOC. And if we seal records, of course, law enforcement, like, it seems important that we discuss what is in a record that is getting sealed and what is getting destroyed, right? Like even if it is in someone's record, some of those things need to get out of the record, don't they? Like, I don't know how it normally works, but it does sound concerning. <laughs> yeah, and again, with the sealing versus expungement thing, that is gonna be something that the Joint Justice Oversight will re-engage with again. Um, and the, but it, uh, I do think it's slightly different. It's related because uh, we're talking about expungements, but the question of what information DOC is using exactly to make its decisions is slightly different because that could apply to any case. Um, right, right. Uh, but way before the, way before the expungement or sealing, I, I totally agree. And it's sort of, it just makes me wonder like what gets defined as what is in a file. You know what I mean? Because right, if, right. and I'm I'm approaching it more with my mindset of like uh, somebody's like just from the social work, social service world, like there are certain things that just don't go in somebody's file and you wouldn't put them in their file because they're not appropriate. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I wish I knew, but I, I think that our committee needs to somehow bracket this issue because if it is, as you said, if it is happening, it's a huge problem. Yeah, and I do think it's actually broader than the expungement issue and in right. some way not solely related to it, but I'm happy to work on that as, as if you do choose to move forward with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Martin, uh, David, actually, do you, I'm looking at the time. Are you okay taking it? In? I have three. I can take it right up to the hour. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I this, this real quick then. Uh, I did kind of probe that question with a couple witnesses at least. And what I did also hear is they weren't necessarily looking at the affidavit to say, oh, this person should have been charged with X instead of Y. There shouldn't have been the plea deal, whatever. Uh, somebody subsequently was saying they were looking at the behavior that was in the affidavit, uh, not necessarily what the ultimate charge was. That may or may not make a difference. I don't know, but I just want to make that a little bit clearer. That that was a little less troubling to me, but 
uh, troubling in a different way. I mean, it'd be much worse if they said, oh, well, this person could have been charged with a felony and that's what we're going to treat this as, but they were pled down to a misdemeanor. So there are some questions that certainly should be followed up on that. I, th I think that's right. I think you make a reasonable distinction, but how that actually plays out in reality in terms of which facts are being used, I think matters a lot and certainly worth looking into that. Thank you. Okay. No other hands and you've got two minutes to spare. <laughs> so, thank you very much. And thank you. To the thank committee. you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, now to turn, turn to the uh, state's attorneys and sheriffs and welcome. Evan, Evan Meenan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Evan Meenan on behalf of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying that, you know, that the department greatly appreciates the amount of additional work that this particular committee put into this bill. Uh, it's, it's a big, important issue. You spend a lot of time considering it. And I think that, um, you know, draft 2.3, which was the one immediately preceding this, um, you know, it was a, was a much improved uh, bill from the department's perspective, but the department is also comfortable with this particular version 3.0 if that's the decision, if that's the way that this committee decides to go. And uh, the department is, is willing to do its best to assist the Justice Oversight Committee in the work that it's going to do over this summer so that hopefully when the legislature reconvenes next year, uh, this conversation about expunging and sealing can continue. Uh, so, so we're comfortable with draft 3.0 if that's how the committee wants to proceed. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. Thank you so much. P appreciate your testimony. Committee members, any questions? Guess not. <laughs> I'm not seeing any hands. Got off easy. Great. Well, thank thank you so much, and um, I know it was short notice, so certainly appreciate it, and then we appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay, so committee, that's all we have on this. I I think in terms of other witnesses, I'm I'm not sure we we need any more witnesses. We you know certainly did hear from legal aid and defender general's office who. Um, who put forth this, this proposal, uh, but I'm certainly turning to the committee uh, to see if they do want other witnesses. Um, language in here also came from, from the judiciary. I would like to uh, put it for a vote tomorrow. So, I'll, uh, uh, Ken. Is administration weighed in on this at all? I mean, I just listened to uh, David. Where's the administration? Well, my understanding uh, from the letter that I received from and the memo that I received from the administration and have the exact date um, pointed out that we were able to get to yes on the DMV piece. And so I took I took that and given that DMV <laughs> is part of the administration and um, you know worked very closely with the judiciary on this. I, I take that as, as support, but but if you would, if you want DMV to come back in, that's. that's well, I don't want DMV. I, I want I want to see somebody from administration. I mean, I just listened to David. I mean, I want it. I mean, in my mind, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of uh, questions that may not have been answered or may not have been asked correctly. God knows uh, what we're going through with this legislative se uh, session, but uh, obviously somebody doesn't like something. And I just want to make sure if I'm going to be involved in a vote, I want to make sure uh, where administration is. That's all. That's fine. I can certainly uh, uh, send Attorney Johnson uh, this draft and ask her to. Uh, if she's available to review it. So that, that, I guess that was my question. Has the administration seen this current draft? They haven't then. They've not seen this current draft, but remember this, this draft is very similar to what, um, what we have 
worked on and what the, um, what the Senate has worked on and the concerns have been in sections that are not in this draft. The administration's concerns have, have all been on sections that have been taken out of this draft. Um, I mean, you're the boss. But I'm happy, happy to send it and, and happy to invite them to testify. I would feel better if we did that. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. All right, so that is, that's all I have for today. We can enjoy the, enjoy the sunshine. And if no other questions, we will adjourn. Just give people a minute to raise their hands. <laughs>